Well, we start our session to collect and process global experience in treating waste. Generally, the waste agenda is very popular and interesting now, and probably there are plenty of people who know more in it, uh, more even than in football or politics. But today, uh, this session will try to focus first and foremost on a specific side, that is to collect and to process. That is, that is, we'll try to discuss at least this part of the agenda in a professional way without any emotion and to the point. Secondly, that in the session we have five, five speakers, five panelists, will have the viewpoint of Moscow and other huge cities and multinational organizations. I'll be giving the floor to speakers and to introduce them at the same time. Our rules of procedure are such that each speaker has 10 minutes niche, but 10 minutes is the limit, and I will cut short any speaker after 10 minutes. Uh, we are in for interesting discussion. I am Kirill Nikitin. I am a partner of WC, and I will try to moderate this session in such a way that it's not just a waste of time, but we'll, we'll know more about specific best practices in the road and in the city. We will discuss all of that, sum it up, analyze, and use it in our daily life so that next year we'll be able to report to you what we used uh, in our practical work. The floor is given to Mr. Solovyov, head of the Department of Communal Services of Moscow. Uh, good afternoon that this forum is very interesting. I visited uh, some of the sessions already, and waste processing and waste sorting and waste agenda in the recent two and a half years, once the range of Kuchina was closed near Moscow, waste dump Kuchina was closed near Moscow, it became a critical issue. Now we have more people who know more about waste than about football in this country. On the 18th of June this year, the government of Moscow has approved a pretty important ordinance and decided before term uh, to start a separate collection of different types of waste. With effect from the 1st of January of 20, near the, let's say, apartment houses, you will have a bin of blue color where all citizens will be able to put useful components, boxes, aluminum, tins, cardboard, etc., any metal. We hope that engagement of the cities will be significant. Well, the first year of the program and uh, will be able to have any interim results in January 2021. The program will proceed, in my opinion, with difficulties, because even now, if you look at the social aspects, if you look at different estimates, really, uh, if you look at some publics and we look, we look at the snapshot of new media, we may draw a conclusion that quite a lot of people are prepared to for, let's say, a divided collection of uh, waste. But is it just a lip service or uh, the readiness to practically do it? At the first stage, we need to create proper infrastructure. We're working with our operators and with all medium and small size companies who are treating solid waste in the city. and. When we talk about implementation of the first phase of the program, the key thing is to create the proper infrastructure. Uh, I will say from the start, 
uh, that there are frequently asked questions. What will happen? with there any penalties for if we do not follow these rules? No, there will be no uh, penalties. The city government does not intend to do anything of the kind. Well, we want to increase awareness. We want to educate people who are going to do it in social media at all business sites. Uh, we are going to do it uh, on the premises of municipal authorities. There will be information boards close to the waste bins. Uh, there will be the schedules for removal of waste, not only the mixed waste, the second bin that will also have be of uh, gray color. But first and foremost, it's an objective to engage people in this program. Well, it all, everything depends how uh, Moscovites will uh, take this program. I earnestly entreat all mass media who are present there uh, to provide their widest coverage about this uh, collection of uh, waste agenda. As for, for the stages of this program, I believe that it will largely depend on the interim results, how fast and to what extent people are really involved in this program. Then probably we'll be able to switch to further things, like let's say divided collection will be more structured. There will be not one bin, but several bins. If if we look at what happened then with this bin, okay, we put uh, our waste into the blue bin, and many, uh, let's say, many citizens say that all useful components are picked up by the same truck and carried to the same dump. No, there will be separate vehicles, also of blue color, which are recognizable, and the secondary waste, which is collected in the blue bin, will be taken away by uh, special uh, trucks. These trucks will take this waste uh, to the sorting platforms, where uh, additional sorting out is carried out. Because under the existing contra contracts, public contracts with the major operators, which exist from 2013, uh, well, they had the obligation to create infrastructure for separate accumulation of different types of waste. These platforms do exist. I wouldn't say that there is no result, or to say that the results are impressive. No, it's not yet true. There are several examples. There is a good example of, like, uh, placing uh, in any public places two types of bins, one bell shape of yellow color. Uh, there is a state-owned catechrome company which implement this program. And well, about we managed to collect about 60 percent of glass or plastic for further processing. People ask, well, okay, we collected this waste. You did additional sorting out. Probably it's again taken just to the normal waste dump. No, it's not the case. There are plenty of companies in Moscow and in Moscow region and neighboring regions and in speed as well uh, who provide different uh, treatment services for the secondary waste. There are uh, businesses which uh, process broken glass or plastic or cardboard. There are plenty of such businesses. Their production capacity well, is adjusted to the existing production base in Moscow and other cities. We are on a daily day, on day-to-day -day co communications with them. They're encouraged with a new program. They understand that the, let's say, raw material base will be uh, growing dramatically. Recently, we said that it took about five to seven years to teach people, Moscow drivers, how to park their cars. 
and based on the significant demand of the public for a separate collection of different types of waste, we think that these businesses will be able to step up their production capacity. These raw materials will be available in bigger quantities and will divide our solid waste according to different types. Sure, we have some questions. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask you in regard to the uh, yellow and green colored uh, bins. Let me ask you a few more questions in regard not only about Moscow but some um, about the whole country. So, what's going on with the split waste collection? What about the batteries? waste batteries collection, what are the current policies in regard to the to these batteries? Because there is, as you know, there are some uh, facilities in Chelabinsk region uh, which are uncertain yet, which are not, uh, and uh, which are questionable on whether the batteries are really recycled there or not. What's going on with the energy saving um, bulbs? What's going on with the energy saving uh, uh, and batteries as well. Uh, are they really dangerous to the environment or not? While saving energy, and also, what about the waste f uh, collection fees, which is uh, very um, actively discussed with the uh, with business? Well, first of all. As, as for the waste collection fees, as for the tariffs, uh, there used to be a time when in Moscow we collected uh, fees. We have some uh, uh, positive and negative experience in this regard. Uh, indeed, we are discussing now at the government level uh, on whether we should play some uh, waste uh, collection terminals. It is not yet. Uh, uh, agreed on whether they will be placed or not. I support this project. Some people do not. But this program should be very well developed in terms of even some minor uh, nuances, some minor conditions. It is important to understand that these uh, uh, terminals will be placed uh, on, on, on the, in private sector, in uh, the, uh, business areas. So if I... so. When I go uh, when I exit uh, a circle blue shop, I should have an equal uh, uh, possibility to receive my five rubles. When I return this bottle uh, into a green shop, so it is very important to really develop this thoroughly develop this program. I'm pretty convinced that this program is very useful and uh, the government of Moscow will support this program together with the federal government as well. Because if you take into account the amount of the aluminum cans, this is a really significant amount of waste. This is how if you calculate this amount of the amount of glass bottles and cans collected as waste in the public areas th th this really becomes a very significant uh, uh, number and if people can uh, get can uh, can get a refund of uh, after after uh, returning those bottles back to the shops this will be quite a significant um, part probably as, uh, as for the energy saving bulbs yeah you can see that there are uh, there is uh, there are um, fewer bulbs than they used to be there According to the federal decree, uh, the usage of such lamps will be, uh, by 2024, it will be uh, restricted for use. In some, uh, th there are some centers for collecting those uh, lamps, those uh, 
in this in the houses or in the, you, can, you can you can there are very few cases that you can see such bulbs uh, even in some public uh, institutes of course there are such lamps and they are still being used but they are now collected by this special organiza organizations and special carriers as for the batteries if we talk about moscow only there are some projects with the retail carriers we collect the batteries the battery boxes in at schools in the kindergartens in uh, in the hospitals as for their as for this waste treatment, and there are some special carriers. Indeed, there are such carriers that utilize these batteries. I'm not sure about uh, the uh, Chelyabinsk plant. Uh, as far as I know, it is quite an operating uh, enter uh, enterprise, which is, uh, and, but I'm not sure about its productivity. Uh, well, thank you very much, Alexander. We should still uh, uh, manage the timing, and uh, so I will say something more uh, at the very end. Meanwhile, let me pass the floor to Martina Abledinger. Who comes from Wayne, who is the head of uh, waste treatment departments? And uh, so, like uh, in the first instance, uh, solve this issue of collection and so, like, and reutilization, utilization of the secondary resources out of the garbage, and uh, how efficient is the system, and etc. And, and uh, you, you, you're asking for, for a switcher for the presentation, correct? Я могу попросить того, кто отвечает за этот зал, передать Мартине переключатель для презентации, а Мартина пока может начинать. Мартина, we will we'll fix it in a minute, so like, meanwhile you may start without that, okay? If, you, if possible. No Thank problem. You. Good afternoon from my side. Uh, when we're talking on waste management, oh, thanks a lot. When we're talking on waste management, the development of waste management systems basically has got three steps. The first and basic step is to ensure health, security, and sanitation, which a waste management can, uh, needs to, to, to do. Second step is um, more advanced, and it was the idea of saving land and protecting environment. In, in Vienna in the 1960s, we found out there is not enough space to put everything on the landfills, uh, and we need to protect our, our environment by good uh, waste management system. And nowadays, the current challenges are to save resources and to make climate protection. And following uh, these three steps, I can show you some examples from Vienna, if I can deal with it. Uh, if anybody can switch one slide, I would be very grateful. Um, yeah, to give you an idea, Vienna uh, is the capital city of Austria. We are in the central uh, Europe region with 1.9 million. For central Europe, a big city compared to Moscow, not such a big city. Um, and next slide, please. Yeah, the idea of municipal waste management in, in Vienna is that the city of Vienna is responsible for the entire chain of municipal waste management, which means we are doing the planning every th six year, years. We make a waste management plan and following through that, we also perform the collection and the treatment of the waste and recyclables until the final disposal of the rest that come out from waste incineration. Um, and the approach of the uh, city of Vienna in waste management follows uh, what we call the hierarchy of waste management. On the top always comes waste prevention and reuse, because as we say, the best waste is a waste that doesn't occur at all. Um, to, to ensure that, uh, we foster waste prevention uh, projects projects for re reuse on the one hand from the uh, public side but also from private private initiatives the waste that still occurs uh, there we focus on separate collection 
Uh, and on that um, topic, it's important to take uh, to make sure that uh, the recy uh, the waste collected as recyclables, beside of the residual waste, has got good quality. Because only if you collect something that can be treated in a process for a real reuse, which means to reuse, um, to recycle the material, makes, makes sense. I always get a little bit um, nasty when I see somebody putting something in a bin where it said recycling on it. Uh, and especially in English language that works, and he's saying, I do recycle. And I then always have to say, no, you are not doing recycle, you just put something in a bin. And if you know what happens afterwards, it could be the start of a good recycling process. But that's an important aspect. And um, for that, um, I think the colleague from Moscow also pointed out an important topic. You need, on the one hand, good material uh, and an idea what to do with the material. And on the other hand, you need the trust of the citizens. If the citizens don't trust that something sensible happens, um, then they won't join the system. And therefore, there are many, many measures beside technical measures uh, necessary. For example, the idea of giving one color to the bin and the same color to the collection car is a good idea because otherwise people always say, oh, I'm not sure if I will believe. Um, yeah, and you need technical and socio-economical solutions. After separate collection, there is still residual waste also in Vienna and for that we go on waste incineration using at least the energy that's inside this residual waste. Uh, and we use that for local district heating and nowadays also a little bit for local district cooling, which is rather new. So no municipal waste goes directly to landfill and for all that uh, stages we are using best environmental technology. So here's some pictures of our incineration plants. The newest one is from year, year 2008. And um, if we would have more time, I would show you the long-term development possibly we have in the discussion time for that. You, ha you have five more minutes, so, like, so feel free yeah. to show as much as you know. Oh, I felt so much under pressure that I was hurrying up. Um, what you can see here, the orange line, is the long-time development of the quantities of uh, waste occurring in Vienna from the year 1900 to nowadays. And you see in the first half of the 20th century, the amount from year to year always was quite the same. But then came the 1960s, economy started prospering, consumption changed dramatically, packaging industry started working, and in this time, the amount of waste generated per year rose from one year to another dramatically. At the same time, that's a dark gray line, at the same time we started waste incineration to produce uh, energy, hot steam, and, and electric power. And, um, even when the um, treatment quantities in incineration were also rising, we still could not reach the point where we did not have still put some amounts to landfill. And therefore we started very early with separate collection. That's a, a light gray line you see. And by that you see nowadays one about the portion of one third of the waste in Vienna is collected separately as waste paper, biogenic waste, uh, scrap glass, metals, plastic bottles, for example, uh, and go to recycling. And um, since two, 10 years now, since we have our third incineration plant, no waste has to go untreated to landfill. Yeah, and to sum it up, I have some pictures. Ah, yeah. Um, we are also really a little bit proud and happy that we are seen as a best practice uh, example and therefore many people like to come to Vienna to see it with their own eyes. Last year we could welcome 59 international delegations from 32 uh, different country, 
countries having an eye on our system and um, for giving us a chance to exchange um, experiences. And ta-da. Yeah, what I want to show you here is we had been very happy that one month ago we could introduce the f first full electric electrical waste collection car in Austria. Sounds quite easy, but the uh, fact was uh, something like that was not on the market and we developed it together with the car constructor, with the one, another firm uh, who is specialist in turning electric uh, trucks, uh, tr conventional trucks to electric trucks. And third firm was the one um, who is expert for the infra infrastructure of a collection car, which is not quite the same challenge like a normal truck. And now we are already testing it in real field and um, it's looking good at the moment. Yeah, the, here a picture of one of our 16 recycling centers beside of the collection from the households. Viennese have the chance to drop off uh, different waste fractions at the recycling centers. And uh, next slide would show you our landfill. Um, for us, it's uh, important that city of Vienna really takes care of the waste of the city. And even if you have incineration, there is something coming out from incineration, the slags and ashes. From that, we put out uh, the metals, for example. But there is still some rest, and you have to do something with that, and that we also that we don't ship away, uh, but we keep it on this uh, landfill site in, within the boundaries of the city. And of course, it's important that something, um, a site like a landfill site, looks nice from outside, that we don't have any problems with our neighbors. And here's some impressions how it looks uh, from near. And in fact, uh, people living nearby feel quite okay and uh, not uh, f in, in any, in any um, feeling of endangerment, but uh, they know that it's, it's uh, a place that has got nothing negative uh, for the environment. M Martin, thank you. So, like, you, you, so we have 10 minutes. So can, can yeah. I ask you something? So the key, key sort of like message of your presentation is that sort of like all the waste that is being produced within Vienna city is being processed and the residuals of like are being burned and the sort of like then the remains after being burned are being used within the boundaries of Vienna city. Yes. So, like, that's, and, uh, that's, I, I, so that's, I got that sort of like that's an important sort of like that's for first conclusion. So can I ask you a different point, a different question, this, this vehicle, this electric vehicle it, it collects waste, so like it is not being powered by waste, though, right? So, like, so, so we have still some work to do, right? On that. I mean, it's it's powered by electricity, oh, okay. and then we can discuss. Of course, you can um, produce uh, electricity in the waste incineration. Plant. Well, I hope in one year time, so like you will tell us that so like it's being just waste is is the fuel of this of this vehicle. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. That was a very interesting point for us. Uh, indeed, it is really great to know that all of this waste is really used within WIN. Let me pass the floor to the next participant, Graham Alabaster. Uh, who is the head department for sanitary and waste treatment in UN habitats? We want to know your view on the issue of waste treatment on the agenda of multinational organization. How cities can switch to the modern model of the waste treatment based on sorting out different types of waste and uh, let's say uh, sorting out and collecting the waste. Is it a modern idea or probably uh, you should uh, use the modern uh, methods of sorting out at the stage of treatment? 
how cities are being switching so like to the to the separation uh, separate, separate 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 collection and is it still a more than idea so like or is there anything more new and more progressive thanks yes thanks very much well i mean i'd, I'd like to sort of start by sharing a little bit habitat's been working on solid waste management uh, uh, around the world for, for several years now and uh, in a short, quick answer to your question, no, of course, recycling isn't a modern idea because in poor economies, uh, lots of people already recycle because they know the value of, of waste. So I think nowadays um, we, we have suffered. I mean, waste, waste is getting such a big problem now throughout the world. In developed economies like here and in, in Europe, uh, we have some of the technical options, but you'd be amazed in some countries in the world where they're still doing the wrong things. And the whole waste cycle, it quite often doesn't work for one of three reasons we've found over the years looking at many countries. Firstly, in, inappropriate equipment. Um, there are many uh, even developed countries around the world which are still using old-fashioned uh, refuse collection vehicles to collect low-density waste. They're not using compactor trucks. So there's a huge, huge cost associated with collection. Municipalities, uh, you know, companies are still lumbered with huge collection costs. Um, I've seen many places around the world where, uh, because of, uh, of, of pre-removal uh, of, uh, of recyclables, that the high organic content of waste has meant that incinerators don't work without you adding diesel to the waste to make the incinerator work. So if you go to many, part, many uh, cities in Asia, you will find places where you, there, there's incinerators that don't work because the calorific value of the fuel, the, the waste is too low to, to make the system work. The other uh, area we're falling down that we need attention uh, is, uh, is on inappropriate institutional systems. A few years ago I was asked to go and advise the city of Sao Paulo in Brazil who were getting very worried because their, uh, their landfills were close, the ones within the city were close to being full. And um, the nearest disposal site was 70 kilometers away. So they said, what could we do? So we looked at the system and we found out that what they've done is they've given away the control, unlike Vienna from the municipality, they privatized waste collection, they privatized the landfill management. And what had happened is the landfills had been filled up with the wrong sorts of waste. Mm -hmm. So you had these landfills in Sao Paulo that were producing huge amounts of, uh, of greenhouse gas because of the organic waste that was going in the landfill. And in the end, uh, at Sao Paulo also had a mechanized composting plant. So in the end, uh, we, which was also not working. So in the end, what we did was we said, well, you need to go back to basics. You need to go to community-based sorting and you need to extend the life of those landfills as much as possible. And that's what we did. We went back to the old fashioned ways of sorting things within communities uh, and uh, to get the system work. So, I mean, I think that, you know, that, that's a lesson coming back to your question in that really, if we're going to make recycling work in any economy, whether it's the poorest countries in the world or the most wealthy, we have to ensure and make use of the community structures uh, and people and, and putting the responsibility onto individuals to separate their wastes. There's no, there's no other solution. Uh, however, uh, however modern a sorting plant you have, uh, there's always going to be a problem. The other issue, of course, which is, is very critical, is we're seeing large amounts of what we call hazardous household waste. So what happens is, if somebody puts a, a, a lead capsule from the top of a wine bottle, right, into a dustbin full of refuse, it's exceeded the limit for lead, okay? So the only way you can deal with that is that you have to encourage and train people to not put that lead capsule into the waste in the first place, to not dispose of that battery. So, I mean, really, uh, as far as we're concerned, uh, whatever system you have, however uh, elaborate your uh, system is institutionally at local authority level, however excellent your equipment is, it will fall down if you don't have it supported by a proper uh, engaged society who understand the importance of, 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 uh, of waste segregation, of waste separation, and appropriate disposal. And that goes beyond just littering. I mean, you know, I, I remember as a child growing up in, uh, in, in London that, you know, uh, there used to be big problems with littering in the UK. There's still a few now, but 
we have changed our attitude to the way we dispose of waste. And I think, you know, um, I think in the long term, uh, we have to move along these, uh, along these routes. We have to look at encouraging this personal responsibility. And even in, uh, in developing countries where uh, there's not the luxury of, of resources to put in good formal waste management systems, by really boosting the local, uh, the local community and separating waste, we actually find that the residual that's left for disposal at the end of the day uh, is, is actually uh, quite a small amount. So I think we've, uh, within UN Habitat, we've, we've decided that uh, you know, we want to support this work a lot more, this changing people's attitudes in society. We have a Waste Wise City campaign, which uh, we launched last year. And this uh, is, a, is, a, is an idea really to uh, embed these thoughts and ideas not just into communities, but also to support local authorities and cities to, um, to uh, use sustainable solid waste management practices. And we're doing that by working to share experiences <coughs> across the globe for some of the excellent examples of work that you have in, in Vienna and in Moscow that we can share with some of the uh, less developed countries in the world. We're also going a step further to encourage um, monitoring and collection of data on waste management. Um, under these marvellous sustainable development goals, um, UN Habitat has to look after with a so-called custodian of goal 11, the city's goal, and within the city's goal, the, uh, the target which all the governments have signed up to for solid waste is there. So what we're trying to do is we're encouraging and supporting countries to develop their information systems for solid waste so they know how much the cities are producing, what the proportion of recyclables are, and how much is actually going to landfills, so they can make uh, progressive uh, moves forward. I was amazed. Um, back in 2010, Habitat did a global report on solid waste management, and we couldn't find any data, reliable data anywhere, so we actually had to go back and do a primary survey in a selection of countries in order to get data, because it, uh, th there's really not a lot of data on, on waste management around. The other area that we think needs attention, um, and this really is to promote um, better waste management projects. Um, we find that a lot of the investment that goes into waste management isn't perhaps done in the most efficient manner. Uh, and in the developing world, uh, it may be a development bank who's, or a bilateral donor who's supporting, but there needs to be a much more better integrated design of solid waste management projects which links good equipment selection with proper institutional arrangements that include communities. So that's another area that we're working on. And of course, the, the fourth area is the idea of awareness uh, and advocacy and encouraging uh, citizens to take their role responsibility for collecting um, solid waste and recycling and source separation. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Graham, th th thanks a lot for your for for your comment on the international so like uh, on the in, in overview in developing countries, etc. So basically, I think the main takeaway from your conversation, or at least from one of those, at least, is that there is no alternative to the separate collection of waste, sort of like in the modern cities. So like nothing technologically suggests that we are at the stage where. We shall skip this part and so if I can move to the separation and uh, pro re pro recycling and reprocessing, so like at a different stage through different technology, etc. Correct? Unless you want to spend vast amounts of money in very advanced technologies. Well, well, c c clearly we want advanced technologies, but no, without money. Yeah. So, like, so, so I guess something like the answer is uh, clear. Yeah. More, more, more economically, not feasible. Okay. Okay, understood. Thanks. So now I'm moving to Sean Rosenmoss, so, uh, who, so, uh, who represents the Department of uh, Environment of San Francisco and the San Francisco Carbon Fund. And uh, basically, so like uh, Sean, so like, well, I, I would appreciate your perspective from the other side of the of the ocean. So like, uh, so like, and you, your perspective specific, if you would mind coming from a different environment and different country and even a different perhaps country within the United States compared to, <laughs> compared to, yes. the, to, the, to the other side of the United States. Uh, it would be great if you speak about the nudging, speak about the uh, building the uh, an environmental mentality across a citizen, uh, across citizen in the city, in the broader country, 
about uh, so like uh, you know creating this environment where carbon uh, and the environment are being first of all separated in the mind, minds but also so like people understand what is the consequences of them of their behaviors so like and how you do that so like through various initiatives within San Francisco okay. thanks right. great and can I get the PowerPoint up thank you um, so yes San Francisco I'm gonna talk a little bit about our climate goals because just to give you some context um, when we started setting climate goals, we were like a lot of other cities and we said things like we're going to be carbon neutral by a certain date or we're going to reduce our emissions 80% below 1990 levels by a certain date, which no one, oddly enough, uh, got excited about when we would tell them this. And so we really had to reframe our goals around climate in a way that people understood and also describe the actions that they were to take. So our climate action goals are zero, zero waste, zero incineration, zero toxics. 80% um, of all trips taken in sustainable modes of transit, so walking, biking, bus. 100% renewable energy, which is getting off of all fossil fuels. So it's energy efficiency, it's getting rid of natural gas in our buildings. So that's our 100 goal. These first three, 0, 80, 100, they're really about mitigating emissions and doing less bad. Our root goal is about doing more good. Our root goal is about how do we absorb carbon from the atmosphere with our soil, with our plants. Metaphorically, though, our root goal is really about how do we get back to our communities? How do we get back to our roots of taking care of each other, taking care of the planet? The way we live now with our waste, I think, is very different than the way my parents lived. Right, like the idea that my kids can go to H&M and buy something for 10 bucks and then like, oh, I'm tired of this, I'm just gonna get rid of it, right? My parents didn't live that way, I didn't really live that way. I think, I think intuitively there's something that bothers us about the amount of waste that we generate. So our roots is about getting back to all of that. Um, and I'm talking about it because it's also very much connected to our zero goal. Um, so our zero waste goal you know, we make it very convenient for people to compost and recycle because we know that they're not going to do it if it's not, if it's not convenient and obvious, right? I mean, there, there, there are some hardcore people who would do it like me, but other people are not going to do it. And so we try and make it very convenient. One of the things that we're really looking at, you know, certainly I believe in the U.S. We've gone, we've gone down this road of, well, it's okay to buy it, it's okay to use it because we can recycle it. Well, actually, the upstream waste connected to this thing that we can theoretically recycle if the person actually puts it in the blue bin, it's 70 times greater, you know, the number of resources that we use to make whatever that, whatever that thing was. So, you know, like Vienna, like every, a lot of cities, we're really trying to figure out how do we address that upstream waste because that's a big one. Um, so this idea of zero waste, though, um, we know that it's, you know, how are we ever going to get to zero waste? We're always going to have some waste. We want to make sure that we either compost it, we recycle it, we reuse it. So when we talk about zero waste, we, we, we want to we turn our waste into a resource, right? But the idea of zero waste has really driven a lot of our policies in San Francisco. So we set the zero waste goal. And since then, we've passed a lot of policies to try and get, get at that idea of stopping the generation. So banning plastic bags in the city. Um, we just recently passed a straw ban. Now, we're not totally banning plastic straws, but you have to ask for a plastic straw if you go into a restaurant or even McDonald's or any place like that. Um, and so when we pass policies like that, we also really want to talk to stakeholders because we don't want a lot of pushback, right? We have found that if we don't bring stakeholders in up front, that we will get a lot of pushback. And so uh, the prime example is when we passed this, when we were talking about let's, let's outlaw straws, right? Let's just say you can't give out straws in San Francisco. Well, the disability advocates came and said, you can't do that. We rely on straws. And so we had not spoken to them. We had not thought of them as being stakeholders in that. So now we had to, we had to tweak it somewhat. And um, so now you can, you can get a straw if you ask for it. But you know, restaurants aren't going to give them out willy-nilly. So there's a lot of those things that we're doing, policies that we're passing, 
to try and address the upstream waste. Some of our challenges are food packaging and our changing consumption patterns, right? Even we have pretty good diversion rates, but still if you looked in our black bin, about 40% of that is organic material. It's food, it's green waste, it's stuff that could be composted. Uh, we have a lot of really big generators, hospitals, cafeterias, schools, right? How do, we, how do we deal with the big generators? And then a huge part of our waste stream, and I would imagine for big cities, it's the same part of your waste stream as construction and demolition, right? As we've got more people moving in, we've got to house these people, we've got to figure out where they're going to go. We've got a lot of construction and demolition waste. And so what kind of policies can we put on the books to deal with that? Um, just looking at the food issue, obviously we want to always look at this whole hierarchy where incineration or landfill is the last thing that you want to do with any kind of green waste, right? You want to collect it, feed animals with it, and then turn it into compost. And the reason we want to turn it into compost is because we create this very healthy soil. And what we have found in California is that if we spread about a quarter of an inch of compost on our rangelands and our ag lands, it sequesters substantially more carbon. So that's, I mean, composting is what nature does, right? Compost is what nature does with its waste. And so if we can actually use it as a climate solution, that is huge. And we're, at, and we're wondering if we start telling this story to people about how we can use our food and our green waste instead of incinerating it, instead of landfilling it as this, this tool to sequester carbon. And, and it can be very low tech, you know? Again, it's what nature does. Nature doesn't have a big composting facility outside of the city. Nature just composts. So um, we're very excited about this, this kind of circular economy when you use compost, you use less fossil fuel fertilizer. It retains more water, which is a huge issue in California with our drought situation. So it's a really good win, and it's a particularly, you know, when we're talking about developing countries, thinking about are we going to go down the incineration route, or are we going to go down this some other route? You know, we're, we decided we're not going to do incineration if we don't have to. And so we have been able to put in infrastructure where we don't have to incinerate except for some of our construction and demolition waste. So, you know, lots of, lots of advertising, lots of partners, and this is what other people have mentioned. You know, we're not McDonald's. We're not the gap. The city of, Depart the city of San Francisco Department of the Environment does not have a huge marketing and outreach budget, right? So we really depend on our partners to help us, whether they're churches, schools, um, we depend on our policies to help us. So we have really stringent policies on the books around construction and demolition. And now we're looking at how do we even mandate greener materials for our buildings, right? Because we know that there is an external carbon impact for all of the materials that we use, right? Not just about what's being generated in San Francisco from a greenhouse gas emission, but but what, what kind of greenhouse gas emissions get generated from the concrete that we're using in a building or whatever else we're using in a building. So um, we, really, we really want to focus on how we green that and how we deal with the waste related to our buildings. Um, and then we also, just in a very subtle way, want to remind people, here's what you do. So last year, we changed our system a little bit so that our blue bin and our green bin are bigger than our black bin. Right, so the black bin goes to landfill. So in a very subtle way, it's telling people more stuff in the blue and green bin, right? Um, we do a lot of work around policy and we never want to pass policy without supporting people through technical support and technical guidance. So we do, we do provide a lot of technical guidance for contractors, for big generators like cafeterias. Um, and we do just a lot of one-to-one -one outreach. I call it the womb to tomb model, right? We, we start with kids when they're really little in school. They have this zero waste infrastructure in their school of the three bins, and then we work with their teachers, we work with the kids on using that. We do a lot of door-to-door -door outreach, we work with small businesses, we work with restaurants, we work with hotels to help them set up this, this three bin infrastructure. Um, and, you know, again, womb to tomb, right? We, we meet with senior citizens, we meet with low-income housing people around, around how to do this, and then um, a lot of community work, 
dealing with our libraries. How do, we, how do we provide more outreach to people so that they understand what to do? Um, and then the very last thing, we're just looking at this, so this idea of separation and, and pinging people. We're looking at some of the big generators and when, if they do a couple of garbage audits and their waste isn't separated appropriately, then they have to hire a company to come in and help them source separate, right? Because it can't all be done at the end and we don't wanna have to pay for it. If you're generating the waste, then you need to deal with the separation. And one of the things that we have found out is that through this zero waste infrastructure, it creates about 10 times as many jobs as this landfill infrastructure creates. Right, and so just looking at these big generators saying, well, you're gonna get a fine if you, don't, if you don't source separate and make sure that you're doing this correctly, there's some financial incentive for them to do that and we think it's gonna hopefully create jobs for people. We, I mean, we, just, we, have, we have people in San Francisco who have barriers to employment, long-term unemployment, and we're hoping that that would turn into a workforce development opportunity for people. So that's some of the stuff that we're doing in San Francisco. Sean, thank you. So, like, I, th I, th I think uh, th there are a few key, key takeaways. I actually, again, focus on the on the zero waste. So, I, and obviously, so like we've heard previously that the best waste is the waste never generated. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, though, so like that, that there is ongoing debate not only uh, here but in states as well as to how much of that can an economy afford. And one thing is an economy of California, so like in San Francisco, and how much of that is could afford an economy of a developing country, et cetera, et cetera. Right. I, uh, вы знаете, я на этом хотел бы передать слово Артему Седову, генеральному директору компании «Большая тройка». Арт... Let me next uh, pass the, the word to Artem Sedov, general director of «Большая тройка». Until now, most of the presenters used to talk about the goals that are set by the governments, by the cities, by the countries. All those KPIs are great to set when you have enough data uh, that you can uh, base upon so that you can uh, make some conclusions on the amount of uh, the uh, wasted amount of uh, collected and recycled batteries or bulbs. This is just one of the uh, examples. There is way more. Uh, will you please talk more about uh, a waste creation forecast, about the facilities, about transport, logistics, goals? Probably those goals are not so nice to talk about, not so popular to talk about as uh, the topics for waste uh, treatment and uh, waste collection they did not gain uh, that much interest from the public, but they are still uh, uh, as much important. Thank you very much, Kirill. Hello, everyone. I'm glad that I'm the last to present because I uh, put down a few questions that I want to uh, base on. I guess that everybody, everybody knows how a waste treatment is uh, taken care of in Russia, but if you compare our policy with the one that is conducted in San Francisco and other cities, no, this problem has been put on the shoulders of the municipals only. From the municipal point of view, the only thing that uh, is taken care of is uh, how the uh, waste uh, recycle bin should look like, and some probably some uh, general data is only taken into account. If you take a look at the general figures, this is what's going on in the world. 2.3, 2.1 trillion tons of waste is created annually, which means that each 30 years we build up another Everest with the waste only. And this happens every 30 years. 
So, talking about the numbers and about the right solutions to make, it is not about oh, it's, it is not only about transport. It is also about technologies. There is a national pro pro project. With the uh, with some goal figures on uh, waste re recycling, but I, I don't mean to say that the amount of uh, waste treatments will be uh, as it will be equal in all the regions. If we talk about Moscow, I'm pretty sure that uh, the goal will be reached. If we are talking about some other dis uh, distant re regions, and when we talk about the uh, if, uh, uh, recycling uh, about the treatment goal of 30 or 40 percent, I would ask, what's, what's the use of it? How do you use it? <coughs> there, there is quite a, a range of technologies for waste treatment. Which technology should be implemented depends on the economic uh, basis and if you, to, to, in order to make a right solution, you should first uh, take into account on how this tr waste is created. If you take a look at the map on the right, the red uh, points over there, this is the forecast which is um, uh, which is uh, framed so you can actually forecast uh, what kind of waste treatment facility should be placed in which place and uh, what sh should be the uh, product productivity of that facility i know how much uh, uh, a ton of waste of, of treated waste costs in Russia it would cost uh, six thousand so okay so we've cre created the facilities uh, we've reported on the results what next without building up the uh, waste recycling facilities If we if we do not recycle the waste, if we only sort the waste without its further recycling, it means that it it, it makes no use. It it's absolutely uh, useless. But since we'll have a lot of uh, waste sorting, uh, split waste treatment facilities. So, if uh, if a ton of uh, waste costs six thousand rubles, you should also take into account the uh, figures and the costs of the logistics of the transportation. Uh, so, in, so that the uh, recycled waste should not only be produced; it should also be. Uh, you should also take into account the cost of the transportation of the recycled waste, because otherwise you will uh, go, you, you will you will just drop below the uh, uh, the economic beyond the beyond the uh, uh, reasonable level of its production. Industrial waste creation should be uh, the the recycled industrial waste should also be used for the construction in our country as well, and this figure should be uh, taken into account so that uh, uh, you uh, yes we can use these figures in order to forecast. Uh, some major things, uh, some um, and, and build up some models in Moscow. But what if we talk about uh, the distances of as much as 300 or 700 kilometers? What if we talk about the distant regions? You should clearly understand that in minor republics there is not much uh, 
uh, se secondary waste which should be uh, economically in uh, interesting for the investors. The waste amount is still not that big uh, in in the minor cities, in the minor publics. Not a single region of Russia developed uh, a mixed system of waste recycling and of uh, the secondary use of waste. So we want them to spend money on waste recycling without making use of the created secondary waste. Still, the secondary waste is not feasibly uh, created, and yet it is not economically efficient. The minor waste recycling uh, uh, facility we built, the less economically beneficial it will become. So it is not only about KPI building, it is also about building a practically efficient model. We should also take into account all the data gained with the uh, global systems. GLONA should be installed in all the cars, in all the trucks, and uh, in all the carriers. Uh, now we can uh, we know which cars collects which kind of no, which cars uh, which car can collect waste and where it collects how much time it spends on the, on the collection we can also uh, draw some conclusions on uh, the most uh, waste producing uh, on, on, on we can also make some conclusions on the places that uh, create waste most you can take a look at the picture uh, so and you can gain some you can make a conclusion how much time a truck uses to collect the waste but most carries apart from the solid waste if we see that those carries uh, stop the engine and uh, it means that uh, they make use of this uh, solid waste uh, uh, later and uh, so well so this data is uh, used can be used even more efficiently it, it is important not only to forecast but also to have uh, and also to monitor the online data and use it to correct the future forecast model Thank you, Artyom. I would like to thank all participants in discussion. I tried to sum up <clears throat> uh, well, a contribution of which speaker, what it means for us, for Moscow and for our country. We have not covered a variety of issues. We have not discussed the economic incentive details. We have not discussed psychological incentives towards, let's say, responsible behavior, both vis-a-vis -vis separate collection and recycling. It's psychology, but what Sean said about different sizes of bins, it's a typical example of using uh, achievements of modern technologies or behavioral science coupled with economic theory, which is used in practical life of cities and governance. All these things we'll try to sum up. And will try to summarize it to be used in the practice of the city. But the conclusion is that we're in a totally different conditions from Vienna or San Francisco. Uh, probably we're setting ourselves objectives which were resolved by the cities in a different era. And, well, we can use more advanced technology solutions and uh, behavioral incentives to address our waste agenda. But we need to say that we would like to discuss this agenda annually at this forum to discuss both global progress and the advancement of our national projects. 
and well at Moscow level. Thanks everybody. Bye.